All right, so I'm going to talk about the relationship between PPF and confidential computing. Uh, <clears throat> I'm actually a member of the technical steering committee equivalent in both foundations, both the Confidential Computing Consortium and the EBPF Foundation. And uh, when I first started being on both, um, I didn't think that, the, I thought that the two technologies were basically orthogonal and they were just two separate things that I did both of. And over time, I kept getting asked as to what is the relationship between them. And in being in meetings and everything on both of them, I've started to think that there actually is some relationship. And so I'm going to share my thoughts here. There's no code here. This is maybe, uh, maybe a slideware architecture discussion, right? Um, it, it is worth noting that out of the premier members of those two foundations, the majority of the uh, premier, premier companies are actually in common. And so my hope is there's a bunch of other people out there that are also uh, interested in the overlap between these two technologies. All right, and so by the way, I gave this, a, a version of the same talk to the technical uh, steering committee of the uh, Confidential Competing Consortium. And of course, there I was telling them about eBPF, and so I put in some of the same slides just so you can see the ones that I showed them or whatever, but I'm not really going to go through them. They're just in the deck, right? And I'm going to tell you about confidential computing stuff that they already knew, right? And so I'm basically giving a variation of the same talk to both sides, right? All right, so this is what I showed them as the definition of eBPF, right? Cross-platform and a privileged system component. This is the definition that appears on like eBPF.io and so on. Um, and this will become important later on, this, this, this specific wording here, okay? Um, I talked about how eBPF runs in many contexts, notably like main processor, coprocessors, you know, smart NICs and so on, uh, and inside and outside containers and so on. All of this will also become relevant, okay? Um, I talked about how there were two scenarios. There were so the same two I just talked about there in um, Lawrence's presentation about, you know, in one case, you're maybe constructing an eBPF program a priori. Maybe you can go off and get it signed by the key that's in your back room. And in the other case, you're constructing on the fly, like PPF trace. Both scenarios exist in BPF, right? So I explained that. I showed them a classic picture here. And I'm putting this up here just so you can get the color coding because this will be playing like spot the differences, right? Um, so this is maybe your classic Linux um, uh, architecture. Um, I showed them the Windows one, and I play spot the differences here. Notably, the verifier and the JIT compiler, compiler move up into uh, user space. Um, the secure environment there, it could be a user space secure environment, or it could be an offline on a different machine. Notice the uh, signing step over there on the other machine, and so you can send it off, send the bytecode off to a secure environment. It does the verifier, the JIT compiler, and the signing step to be provided. Okay, this is the example where it's actually signing the uh, JIT compiled code, not the bytecode. Right? You can do it either way. I talked about both variations in my talk last year, uh, but here we're talking about signing the actual native code, um, so that we'll actually work with the HVCI case that I talked about. Okay. So the point is, you can have a secure environment that is potentially not on box, okay? Okay, so now we're gonna talk about confidential computing, now that I've showed you what I showed them in a way that is relevant to the later slides, okay? So notably, confidential computing, here's the, the, the definition from the CCC. So the protection of data in use, that means like your memory pages and so on, it's already loaded, it's executing, right? Can somebody poke into the process memory and change stuff? Um, by performing computation in a hardware-based, attested, trusted execution environment. Okay, you say, well, what's a trust execution environment? Okay, well, it's an environment that provides assurance against data integrity, code confidentiality, and code integrity. That means people can't modify the data that the process is using. Uh, people can't um, extract and, and, and peek at the data that the, that the process is using. And people can't change the code that's executing the process. Okay, and if the hardware uh, uh, TEE can actually enforce all three of those, then you can call it a TEE. And if you're performing execution of something in there, then you can call that confidential computing. Okay, so this is the definition that the CCC has. Okay. Here's a picture using the same color coding of what some, there's different variations of TEEs. This picture applies to things like SGX from Intel, Trust Zone from ARM, and some other ones. I mean, there's things like RISC-V where you can build your own, so there's multiple compositions, and so on. So this picture would apply to SGX, Trust Zone, and things like that. Okay. So at the top, you write a uh, TEE library um, with some source code. You run it through a compiler tool chain. You get a binary. You sign the binary. All of this is done in some secure environment. Um, you then take that signed binary, and you have an application that calls into some TEE library to say, I'd like to load and talk to this thing, please. Okay. 
Um, it then loads and talks inside the TE after it verifies the signature. And so there's a TE runtime, which in the SGX case is a hardware processor with microcode. And in the trust zone case, there's actually a little OS there. You'll see a diagram of that later on. Um, and so it executes in there, and they can communicate back and forth, and they can use shared memory. You can say, gee, there's a lot of things in common here, and which the color coding is hopefully um, able to help you see. And you can see the rich execution environment, trust execution environment. Okay? And so um, notably, um, on this style of TEEs, the programs that run or the, the, the signed TE libraries are all passive, right? which means you hook them up to some event. right? The event ex runs. It, it executes a bunch of stuff inside here, and then it returns. Sound familiar? Um, yeah, exactly. All right, so you can say, gee, okay, there's a lot of, just looking at the technology itself, there's a bunch of things that are actually consistent between them. Okay? Can you actually compose them for some doing something interesting? Right? Is there actually any use case for, for doing something interesting? Right? So let's talk about this. And so this is, again, just one of the ways of constructing TEs, the SGX and trust zone style of stuff. So after this, I'm going to kind of rotate the RE TE boundary to make it look like, more like the previous picture. Okay? So putting them together, MEPF is a cross-platform technology that can run sandboxed programs to extend a privileged system component. Well, a TEE is a privileged system component. Okay. Um, it doesn't run in the main processor. It may, may not run in the regular part of the processor. So in that case, it's sort of like running eBPF at a smart NIC, right? I can kind of you know, offload it into the smart NIC and it runs over this other processor. I want to offload it over into the TEE side of the processor or a TEE processor, and it's similar to offloading a program or a code into a smart NIC. Okay? We know how to do that in BPF, right? And both of these two scenarios, both the design time one where I may get stuff pre-signed and the dynamic generation of code, more like the BPF trace, can still apply. Okay, even in the TEE case, both of those scenarios, you can say, oh, there's all these things you can do in both scenarios. Okay? For security projects, right? many people want to do the security projects just like, I want to write my security stuff in Rust. Good idea. I want to write my security stuff to actually run inside of a TEE. There's a trend towards doing that. Okay? And so all these same scenarios can still apply. So what would it look like if I composed these two pictures that I've shown you, the BPF picture and the uh, TEE picture? Okay. So at the top, you have an eBPF program that goes through and you get some BPF program bytecode. Okay. You then submit that off to a secure environment. This is like the, the static case, right? I submit it off to there where this could be um, off machine if it's the static case, or it could be on machine if it's the dynamic case, because on machine, the key is not in the process. The key is inside a secure environment, which could be inside of a TEE chip. Okay. So this is not as good as saying it's off in a back room someplace. Okay. But it's better than saying the key is accessible to various processes and stuff. And so I could potentially do online, on machine signing by a key that's inside the TEE. Okay. That is a possibility uh, for the runtime case. Okay. Dave, uh, in this case, the, uh, the verifier and JIT also run in the enclave, or they run like uh, this, is, this is not running in DEE, but do they um, need to be in that? Or? No, notice I put example in the top right in the title there. In this example, yeah. I'm showing a case where, yes, the verifier and JIT compiler would be running inside the TEE. Do you have to do it that way? You have to analyze the security properties, and if you don't, you have to convince yourself that you're not violating security properties. So it's easiest to depict in the diagram that I showed, like the CCC tag, if I show that it's being happening inside the enclave. Okay? Then it's easiest to convince people that's true. I don't know if, that's, yeah, it, uh, if that is necessary, but it is certainly sufficient. Okay, yeah, I agree. Story. I think. It, it, in this case, yeah, you would you would really want the JIT to be in the uh, enclave because yeah, uh, yeah. you want to be able to trust the JIT, right? Like, exactly, exactly. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. And so Thank you. you notice this box here matches um, what we started doing in uh, Windows, right? We're not doing it with you know confidential computing or whatever, but this notion of saying put the verifier, the JIT compiler, and the signing component inside a secure environment that's not in your normal kernel, okay? It's kind of the direction we already started going in Windows, and it's just consistent with that. It's just going the next step, right? And, you know, gosh, I'd like to do that in Linux too, by the way. Um, okay, so once it's inside there, okay, then your normal application can load it because now you have a signed binary just like in the, in the TEE slide, right? You have a signed uh, binary because it's already gone through the JIT compiler, right? which I showed like what we're doing on Windows when you have HVCI, right? Um, and so then you can use shared memory API calls, and it goes inside, into and out of the enclave, which is just like calling in between two things, okay? All right, so that's one example of composition, 
Okay, so what's going on here is you're doing runtime signing, which addresses the point that I was uh, talking to Lawrence about in my comments back there, okay? That's one of the ways of applying them together. Here's another way. The trend now, oh, this is a, uh, the older slide, maybe not the one that's on the share right now, uh, but that's okay. The only change is the title change to be more understandable. CVM, if you guys don't know what that is, um, if you look on the latest share, it says VM with uh, TDX or AMD SE VSNP. Okay. So I talked previously about like SGX and TDX and so on, sorry, SGX and Trust Zone and so on. A different style of TEE is one that you can run a logical virtual machine all inside that secure part of the processor. Different technology, right? Because you have to have the ability to you know, run threads and things like that instead of just be purely passive, call in, do stuff in return, okay? So this style of stuff, you can run an entire VM inside there. And again, Intel, TDX, and AMD, um, SNP, SEV, SEV, SNP fit into this category. So in this category, you have uh, the red is the TEE, it's the secure VM or the confidential VM, okay? And the stuff that's outside the red box is in the rich execution environment, okay? Which you have, you know, your uh, hypervisor, your host OS, um, and a TE library and things like that, okay? And so inside the guest OS, this could be just classic Linux with your existing kernel that already has BPF in it, right? It's just a VM, right? And so inside here, um, typically inside of a CVM for doing communication securely, then you have some attested communication that comes out. So this is showing an example where app one is kind of a, a, like a management daemon that can be installing other things, right? This could be like a cube agent, it could be uh, uh, any other type of agent that um, might be installing binaries like an app installer, uh, whatever it is, okay? So in this example. And so it typically does a tested communication out and then it gets back maybe a secure workload. Here's some stuff to run once I know that you're running inside of a TE. You can run this confidential workload with some secret data, go and do some computation that's protected from anybody outside, including whoever's owning and hosting the machine like in a cloud hoster environment. And so uh, what happens in these is it may get back either app data to be run or even another app to install, okay? This is what happens in how people, oh, here we go, now the example title is actually correct, so. Um, so the app deployment actually goes and dynamically installs this app too or maybe just the app data for an existing one. It says run this stuff and protect it from anybody outside so they can't peek in it, okay? So this is what happens in TDX and, and, and SEVSNP today. So with that, you can, pretty easily see, well, that app one could just, instead of installing app two, it could say, I'd like to inject this eBPF program, please, right? I've already got the technology to attest out to say that this is running inside there, go and fetch stuff and maybe install it, right? So that product is pretty simple because you don't have to change Linux anyway. You kind of already have this as long as you, you write an application, okay? The user space application that does attestation just like an attestation would be doing inside any of the other scenarios for, for this type of VM, okay? Since it's like the least work, you kind of already get this one almost for free. If you're doing this whole example, you are basically already have BPF now, whether you're using it or not, right? You already have BPF you can be using in a confidential computing context for the scenarios you already have. And they're confidential because the, in the sense, whoever's hosting the machine, right, doesn't have access to what that BPF program is doing, just like it doesn't have access to anything the VM is doing for that matter, right? This is the, that, so this is the, uh, the, the confidential VM case. Okay, uh, last example, I mentioned I was gonna come back and show you Opti, so here's uh, Opti, the way that Opti works, um, and so this is on uh, ARM Trust Zone example. And so on an ARM Trust Zone processor, you have the, 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 the normal OS, so let's say uh, the thing on the left, for sake of argument, to show that it actually isn't relevant here, let's pretend that the one on the left was Windows, it doesn't matter, it could be Windows, Linux, or anything else, and the one on the right, uh, actually let's use the case with our REOS, that's, that's Linux, let's use that. The one on the right has a kernel, okay, but it's not a full VM. Um, Opti is a very lightweight OS that's meant to run inside the um, uh, TEE on a Trust Zone processor. Remember I mentioned that Trust Zone is, is passive, right? You call into it, it does work and it returns, right? It's not like a full OS. So this is a very lightweight OS that can still manage pseudo processes and, and, and dispatch you know, remote procedure calls between the two sides, okay? It can't like generate threads and things like that, uh, it doesn't have, you know, like a networking stack or anything, but it's a basically a mini OS. And so that's what Opti is, okay? And so the way that this one works is since Opti, you can install multiple, what they call apps, right? We might call those maybe uh, libraries. Um, you might call, they, they call them trusted apps. Um, you can install multiple trusted apps inside the TE on top of Opti. 
And so the way that works is you have a trusted application one that's like your management app um, that tests outbound, maybe gets some other stuff and installs it, and it looks a lot like the, the, uh, the TDX SNP SEV picture. Okay. So what comes back in is maybe I'd like to install TA2 on this machine or this device, or maybe I want to install just some app data that's already in, that's used by TA2 that's already there. And so the same thing can happen there in theory, right? This is the part where it's purely slideware, right? It says, today, Opti is a miniature, uh, a very lightweight, secure OS, okay? It doesn't support BPF today, but slideware, it could, right? We put, we put BPF into lots of other things, right? This, uh, other BPF runtimes and so on. If we put a BPF runtime into Opti, then you can even do it on an ARM Trust Zone processor on a you know, Cortex-A class device, for example. That'd be pretty easy, right? Now, we'd have to work with the Opti community to get that upstreamed, but it's absolutely possible to do this, right? And it works just like the other slides. Okay. This part, I said, nobody's working on this. This one's slideware, but architecture-wise, there's no reason this wouldn't work. Okay. Um, last part here, big topic, one of the main topics that the CCC works on is the whole topic of attestation in the context of a confidential computing environment, right? Because all of this, uh, all of the TE attestation is a requirement to be part of confidential computing, right? You're not only running a TE, you have to be able to attest that you're running a TE, right? You have to be believable that you're actually running a TE for the use cases, right? And so there's three types of uh, ways to use BPF where it interacts with, with um, attestation on very different axes. Okay, so the first axis is to say, um, I'd like to use attestation in order to decide how and whether to deploy an eBPF program. Okay, so this is the cases that I walked through in the previous picture where you would test outbound um, and you're then handed, here's, by the way, here's your remote, remotely, here's your eBPF program to install and then I install that. And I only want to install the BPF program into something that can attest. Okay, so that's sort of the first category of how attestation and BPF could be used together, which is your BPF orchestration system, whether it's you know, Bumblebee or Leaf or whatever you have internally, um, could make use of attestation to deploy stuff into a TE. Second category, completely orthogonal to that, is I would like to write um, eBPF extensions to existing communication that's attested. Okay, so I've got some attested TLS session going on, and I would like to install eBPF programs underneath to, to, to maybe monitor that, observability, whatever it is. Okay. And so here, I'm trying to deploy code into something that's already been attested, right? The communication may already be live, and then I install the BPF program. Does that or does it not invalidate the attestation of that session? Because I've just changed the code that was attested when that session was established. This is the stuff of, this is a lot of the stuff that the attestation SIG in the CCC talks about a lot, is to say, how often do I have to attest? If I attest a session, is that for the lifetime of the session? What if there's code changes, right? BPF is something that can cause code changes to your TCP when you've attested, right? If you allow a BPF program to be installed after the fact, right? And so that means that, say, if I attest at, say, boot time, then that is woefully insufficient if I can install BPF programs post-boot, right? So they have to be aware of that when designing um, attestation mechanisms for attested communication. Okay. They either have to say, yeah, there's some time window, right? It, it was attested there, and that's good for the next, you know, you know, 10 minutes or something like that. And the code may have changed since then, and I'll figure it out after 10 minutes, and I'll reattest. Okay. So that's the style of discussion that happens in that SIG. The third category is also completely orthogonal, which is to say, I would like to do some attestation. I'd like to write an attestation algorithm in a BPF program, right? Just like you can write a congestion control algorithm, right? You can run a, a, a firewall, you can run whatever. I would like to write an attestation policy using a BPF program. Okay, so this isn't attestation for BPF, this is BPF for attestation, right? And so I could write a BPF program that somehow takes existing traffic and only uh, passes, uh, only allows it to pass up through a particular layer um, if it vouches that, the, that, that it's been attested. Right? I can insert that at a different, at, at any particular layer. Or I could check that in APIs to say that, this, uh, that the program, and uh, you'd say this kind of overlaps with maybe what the gatekeeper does, right? Or I could, um, in um, attestation, there's a verifier, okay, which is this concept of the thing that you pass your attestation data to, and it decides whether you're good, and then it gives back an answer, and then you can use that answer in authorization checks. So uh, verifiers, often but don't always run on some server someplace, okay? 
Um, they could be running on box, but um, for scalability, people like to run them on some separate server somewhere. And so you could say, well, I want, want to allow BPF programs to run inside the verifier to say I would like to extend the verifier or observe the verifier in some way. Okay. So all of these are use cases, very different use cases for saying I want there to be some interaction between eBPF and confidential computing. Either to use eBPF as part of confidential computing or use confidential computing as part of BPF or whatever. So my takeaway is uh, when I first started being on both committees, I thought that they were completely orthogonal and that there wasn't really any significant overlap. Uh, this is my conclusion now, is some of those are like immediate term, like the case that I mentioned, you can deploy BPF programs into a CVM that runs Linux right now, okay? No difference, okay? Um, to things that are much more speculative like, hey, should we put BPF runtime into Opti, right? And everywhere in between. So. That is the end. Now you've seen the same presentation or a variation of it that I presented to the CCC. I'm uh, happy to take any questions. You're all stunned. You're all ready for lunch. I'm curious, like, what is the feedback from the CCC? Like, where do they, I mean, see, like, an immediate use case they would love to adapt eBPF to? Or, like, 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 like what was the discussion there? Uh, I, I think overall, the people that were in the meeting were not familiar with BPF as much, and so they were in the, gee, thanks for the information, need to think about this, right? It was, it was more of an education um, thing, which was also great, right? The fact that we could come from, you know, the, the BPF community and educate the, C, the, the, the confidential computing community was a great thing. Um, and I think within the attestation SIG, they said, yeah, we should talk about these things. Because um, I mentioned, you know, how, how long is an attested session good for before you have to reattest it, right? If there could be code changes underneath it. It's something that they said, yeah, we'll take that on as a, as a discussion item that they hadn't really spent significant time talking about. They had started on it, but they didn't realize that BPF could change, you know, like your code underneath them. The people that were working on that hadn't really considered that aspect of it. And so they need to take that, and so now they're kind of talking about that. And so that, that was, the interest was mostly uh, in terms of immediate stuff was in the, the how, how do I deal with the tested communication? Because there's a whole SIG for that right now. How is this different from any other JIT, Java? Like why they were surprised that the program can generate code? Uh, because in confidential computing with the notion of signed binaries and hardware-based enforcement, then the notion of dynamic code, um, uh, going back to the, the, the style that's not the CVM case, I'll just use this one here. In this case right here, you don't have dynamic code, right? So in Java application case, is not allowed there. In this case, you do have dynamic code. In this case, you don't classically, right? Sure. And so this is the case, this is the style, you know, SGX has been around for, you know, decade or something like that. And so the, the most classic one that everybody kind of has thought through starts from this assumption here. And this style is the new trend, right? TDX is new, SE, SEV, SNP, they're like you know, less than two years old, right? And so all the deep thinking hasn't been done on this part, all the deep thinking has been done on this part, and so that comes with a bias in terms of blind spots, right? Okay, but like in this new model, Java could run inside the trusted environment. Uh, yeah, and they would say you should never run an, uh, run an interpreter inside this one here because it doesn't have security properties. It, sure. It's not safe. Um, the security people will tell you that any time that you put any interpreter of any sort inside of a secure execution environment, that you cannot prove that you're not susceptible to side channel attacks. Okay. Right now, the evidence is that you are, right? But certainly, the, the, the claim is there's no proof that you're not, right? So they said it's extremely dangerous to put any interpreter into any secure environment, period. Okay. And so if we said, you put Java in there, they would say, please don't do that. You are insecure, or at least you can't prove that you're secure. You're probably susceptible to attack. So how is BPF different? What's that? How is BPF different? How is BPF different? Yeah, how are you going to convince them? Uh, that's a great question. I, I, but um, I would say, if I go back to this picture here, right, um, really, it, it goes back to what we were saying before. I should say, if you talk about the static case, where you can take a BPF program, assign it in the back room, now it fits into their existing model. It's only the runtime case that says, if I want to run BPF trace inside there, then you get them to worry about stuff. But if you say, I just want to use BPF for the static case because I want to deploy you know, my layer four load balancer written in a BPF program or my NAT or whatever, they'll say, yeah, that works great. Um, so first, thanks for the talk. It certainly gave me a lot to think about. <laughs> That's uh, what they said too. <laughs> Um, so I have a more generic question. So I, I stopped following this stuff like back 10 years ago with SGX and Haven and, and things like that. So I'm wondering, like, does it look like 
one either one approach like the enclave hx approach or the evm approach tdx or whatever it's called will prevail like is it one more useful than the other or kind of it seems like both will be relevant uh, so it, if i understand your question you're asking between these between these two models between like this style picture and this style picture is one more useful than the other uh, i would say the trade offs are the uh, are are um, uh, on the plus side of, of this, this one here has a smaller TCP, right? There's a lower attack surface area, there's fewer lines of code in this style of stuff inside the, the red box here. The red box is as small as possible, which means you can get a higher confidence in the level of security in it. Okay? It's easier to analyze because the set of code is much, much, much smaller, like by two orders of magnitude or something. Okay? And so this one has the small TCP, which lets it scale down to small devices, and it's easier to security vet and get higher confidence. So there is a argument that this one is actually more secure, okay? because you can actually reason about it and get a belief that it's more secure. Right? This one, on the other hand, is the one that is far easier to incrementally deploy. Right? At the, on, uh, on this style here, I have to rewrite my apps to use this model. Okay. It'd be similar to saying, take an arbitrary app and take half of it and write it in a BPF program. Right? You're going to have to rewrite some of your logic. Right? Where this one is saying, um, I can take an existing unmodified app that just runs on Linux and I can run it there with no changes. Okay? That's the part that makes this one be super attractive and why the world is moving more towards this one in terms of the dominant case. Because people just want to lift and shift. And you can use this one to lift and shift. Okay? Take your existing app and run it, no changes, is very attractive. And so that's why very high security conscious things, like maybe in the um, uh, critical infrastructure case, might be using this one, uh, you know, some defense department in whatever your country of choice is. Um, whereas this one is, you know, the masses that want to do stuff for, you know, financial and just regular business purposes and stuff will move to this model because it's so easy, okay? So this one is the easy onboard to actually get confidential computing in the first place. And if you've got uh, plenty of spare cash to like rewrite your apps and want the ultra secure thing because you care about nation state attackers, then you go to this model. All right, thank you very much. This was super interesting.